Welcome back, Snackcasters. Welcome. So we're still rolling on, cruising through um, what started out as a conversation about epigenetics, and it's kind of migrated into an informal book review of Mind Over Medicine by Lissa Rankin. Lissa Rankin, yep. Um, so we're, It's kind of tough in the middle, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, I mean, not to be critical, but, you know, you mean. find you're daydreaming and... Right. You know, but I'm kind of a case study guy, right? Like, give me examples. Get give right. me. Um, so it, it kind of falls a little short in the middle, my opinion. Um, so it actually gets into one where we're at now, right? And that's kind of. So we, we were talking about the epigenetics and how community was so important, right? We talked yep. about the community in Pennsylvania that, that had great health, right? Um, and then. You know, we're moving on into all right. What is what does this look like? What does happiness look like, right? And how does how does happiness connect to physical illness? Right, like true physical illness or lack of happiness by right how you perceive your life. So there's there's two there was two studies that that are part of this, and uh, there's the first one was really interesting is the Harvard Grant study, and it was done from People were selected from between 1941 and 1944, and they were Harvard students. They were sophomores, and they selected 268 of them, and based on all kinds of criteria. The number one criteria was they had to be physically fit. They wanted to see how people, uh, how their health changed over the course of their life when the starting point was literally all the same. Right, it's best they could. Yeah, control. yeah, this is the best you know, human specimen that we have from Harvard in this class, and and then they they looked at them over their lifetime. Uh, they literally checked in with them on a pretty regular basis. How you feel and how's your life going? They went under extensive medical reviews, literally from 1941 all the way up through their life. Like wow, extensive study. So that would, yeah, I mean, it, it's something that started in 41. They would have been, what, 19 years old. So most of them probably passed or very. And a, multiple aging. scientists through this whole thing, right? I mean, like psychologists, doctors. I mean, it was like it, the fact that 268 people committed to this is a true testament. All That's crazy. Dude. All by itself. I don't want anyone tracking me for more than a couple of days. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. What they found out was really off the chain that if they de- if the person developed depression by the age of 50 about 70 percent of them were cr- chronically ill or deceased by the age of 63 yes 70 percent of them so d- so clinically diagnosed with depression correct so hang on so 70 percent Seventy percent. If they had clinical depression at age fifty, by sixty-three, they were deceased or chronically ill. So that's where you start to connect the dots. That where we started out with epigenetics, what you think affects your health, and we'll get into this deeper. But so during that study, there was another person, another scientist by the name of Seligman. I believe I, I'm getting this correct. Sorry, and, and, and the opposite of that was also true uh, with regarding uh, the Grant study was that uh, for those that said they were happy, only 10% of them died or got chronically ill. So do we know by chance, I haven't gotten as far in the book as you, do we know by chance, like, was did, did they comment on the average lifespan? It sounds like one it was, six, was six, early, mid-60s. Sounds like the other may be. Gosh, push it's it significantly longer. Yeah, it was significantly longer. Um, so interestingly, uh, the scientist that I mentioned, Seligman, she goes on and takes this grant study and looks at the data further. And uh, they even take it from her. And they other scientists turned around and looked at it. And they looked at it with lab rats, if you can believe that. And they took three sections of lab rats. They took... One, which they would shot. Now, they injected them all with cancer tumors. Yeah, that's tum- very important. Yeah, yeah. They injected them all with cancer tumors, every single one of them. I think there were about 100 of them, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they took one section of them, and they would shock them on a regular basis. They took another section, and they taught them how to avoid the shock. Right. 
and they took another group that they did nothing with. They didn't teach them how to get shocked. They didn't teach them not to get shocked. Okay. But they did randomly get shocked. They did randomly get shocked. Like they bump a wall or whatever the mechanism was. The number of uh, rats that developed cancer in the group that got shocked was off the chain. It was statistically significant, right? The group that they taught not how to get shocked. How to avoid. How to avoid the shock had very little to zero incidences of cancer, even though they injected them with cancer tumors. And the control group came in second, where they didn't teach them anything. So it goes back to stress. Wrapping, exactly. It goes back to wrapping your head around what she's been talking about in this book originally about uh, uh, stress and how it relates to physical illness. Physical. <clears throat> Not just how you, how you feel about yourself. Like literal chronic illnesses. Right. And it goes back to the very beginning of the epigenetics conversation is what you think. The most powerful of the eight epigenetics. Is in your thoughts. So if you believe you're stressed, you develop illness, you don't allow your body the proper rest time, and you actually can get sick. And we're going to go into something on probably one of the next uh, snack casts about the difference between optimism and pessimism. You know, it reminds me almost like as a little kid, man, sitting in Sunday school and that song, count your blessings, name them one by one. If you think about the words of that song. Literally name them one by one. You're thankful for your wife. Thankful for your kids. Thankful for shelter. Thankful, uh, for, thankful for my kids. Just well, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> yes, I'm thankful for. My you kids. know, but how, how how often do we sit and go? Okay, these are the really awesome things in in my life. No, we and often will. Really we, give how are you doing off. today? Oh, you know, today stinks. Yeah, yeah well, I'm okay. Right. I yeah. hate that. I, are you ever great? Well, even worse, and getting on that subject, even when you realize, if I ask you, Scott, how you doing? You're like, oh, I'm okay. How often do I go, hey, let's sit down and have a conversation about what's not okay right now? You yeah. know, oftentimes you're like, yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> red flag, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> I, I, it was really just conversation making. I really right. didn't want to know right. how you're doing. Right. Anyway, I think we should so, wrap this one up. All right, wrap it up. Uh, questions, comments, concerns, email us at snackcast at yes.fit. Stay moving. See ya.